and just how much waste had ended up at the bottom of the drinking water. There was actually four to six feet of power plant waste at the bottom of this precious drinking water source. What we did after we brought that, uh, that delegation out onto the lake, pictures were snapped, Boston Globe ran a photograph of what we had found in the lake. Uh, within a hundred days from that moment, we had assembled a team of local elected officials, state elected officials, federal officials, we had the Army Corps of Engineers, we had um, concerned citizens, local experts, biologists, everything around a huge table, and we negotiated a cleanup. And the cleanup took six years, and then it took about $10 million. But what was at the core of that cleanup? And what is so rare that we actually had this success was Jan's incredible ability to get people around the table and get people who normally would be fighting each other to sit down and say, okay, here's what we have in common, and now we're gonna go forward and we're gonna solve this thing. Instead of fighting, which it's in our nature to do, he, he, his talent and his ability to do this is really what brought about this tremendous success. So for anybody who goes to a restaurant in Salem, if you don't live there, or you go to a restaurant in Beverly and you ask for a glass of water, your water is a lot cleaner because of Jan's negotiating skills. And if you actually live there, the water you're drinking every day, or in Wenham, um, your water is cleaner for Jan's ability to negotiate that settlement. So, and I've seen this in many other instances in his, in his life and in his practice. Um, and there's a book that you all, if any of you go on to law school, it will probably be a case study if you study environmental law or even other areas of the law. Um, his story is extraordinary. Uh, it, it details um, uh, the, the story of Uber. Allow me the great honor of introducing my friend, Attorney Jan Schlickman. Lori was very kind. I was able to open my eyes there and see things around me that I had been missing. So I owe a great deal of gratitude to uh, Lori and a whole bunch of other people who Lori has inspired, and she is an inspiring person. We're very lucky to have her as our elected representative in Marblehead, for sure, and Swampskit, and, and a little part of Lynn as well. Uh, but we're also, she's a treasure for the, for the uh, North Shore. But you know what? You're a treasure. And I'm really excited and honored to be here today, because um, it was 18 years ago that some folks got together, and they had this insight this incredible insight, and they decided that this insight about people and how we treat each other and how we treat our planetary home, that there was this insight that they had that they knew had to be shared with others. It was a, not to be kept a secret. And they formed this little institution, this North Shore, this jewel, this little treasure here of mediation services, and over the last uh, almost two decades, um, well, you, you have been you have been the beneficiaries uh, of that, uh, that thought, the planting of that thought. And I thought that today, you know, it's an honor for me uh, to be here, I wanted to really kind of uh, talk about that thinking, that kind of different way of thinking. And this gift, really, that has been shared with you, which I hope that you will share with others, because this idea, this way of thinking about how we should treat each other in our planetary home, how we should do that, is a gift that will enrich your lives, the lives of your families, and your community, and it is definitely something not to be kept secret. Now, I know you didn't invite me here to talk about such things. You want to know what it's like to have John Travolta play you. That's really why I was invited. I get this asked a lot, you know, and um, I think that my mother had the best answer. She was asked by a woman who was little and old and Jewish. She said, Travolta? My mother said, well, you know, a handsome Italian boy playing a nice Jewish boy, what's not to like? Could have been Joe Pesci or Danny DeVito. <laughs> so I was really lucky, you know, they chose Travolta. And, um, you know, uh, I know that uh, you know, when Travolta was uh, asked to play this part, it was really disturbing to him. You know, he, he jumped on one of his six jets, you know, and he, he flew out to Burbank and he went to the Dwarfs building, which is, uh, they got the Dwarfs are holding up this building about 70 feet tall and Right there on the seventh floor there, you know, Travolta, he just laid it on the table to the Disney folks. He says, look, I can't play the Schlickman guy. He's too greedy, too materialistic. 
I said, hmm, how about $20 million? Okay, I'll try. <laughs> All I know is he made a lot more money playing me than I ever made playing me. <laughs> but I don't begrudge him any of that. It was, I got the experience, and it was fun. But one of the great things of going through this experience in which they wrote a book, and a really great book, actually, Jonathan Haar wrote it, and pretty good movie, and um, I urge all of you to have that experience. You know, you should go through this like therapy, you know, where you get to read and relive all the mistakes that you made and uh, forced to think about what did you learn. But I'll tell you the thing that I envy about all of you today is that because of this gift that was given 18 years ago, um, you have a way of thinking, a way of looking at life that I did not have at your age. I had a different way of thinking. And I really didn't get this other way of thinking, this gift that was shared with you, until much later in my career as a lawyer. And I have to tell you, when I came into this new way of thinking, it changed me. You see, before, I was a really great lawyer. And after I learned this thing, I became a really bad lawyer. But I think, maybe, I hope, a little better person. And I began to see that there was a need to think differently. That how I had been looking at the world and these problems that I cared deeply about, that we all should care deeply about, that how I had been trained to think, that it was my thinking about things that was actually getting in the way of solving the very problem I was so committed to getting solved. Well, now think about it. You see, I was a lawyer. And I was trained, and uh, you know, I cared about people. And you know, when my client came into my office, you know, and they talked about, uh, well, about power trying to destroy them, well, I was a lawyer and, and I wanted to be their champion, you see. And I said, well, well, if power is trying to destroy you, why, I'll go to the law. The law gives you a lot of power, and I'll get the law, the, the power that the law gives you, and I'll try and destroy the power that's trying to destroy you. <gasps> I learned something. A little bit of human physics. Power, destroy power, it's a physical impossibility. Well, no problem. You see, when they came into my office and they're talking about being punished by power, well, it was very simple. I'm a lawyer. Hey, I'm going to get all that power that the law gives you. I'm going to use that power and I'm going to punish those who are trying to punish you. But you know, I went through an experience and I learned something. Another little bit of human physics. Punished power Oh, he seeks its revenge. Oh, well, no, no, no problem. You see, they're coming into my office and they've been abused by power. Now, I will take the power that the law gives you. It gives you a lot of power. And I will abuse the... Me? Abuse power? And I became confused. You see, I was a lawyer. Well, all that training and I... Well, if I can't destroy or punish or abuse, what good am I? I became very confused, you see. And, well, I... I did what any self-respecting human being would do in such a circumstance. I got out of town. I went to Hawaii. But as far as you can go in this country and still be in this country, it's a beautiful place, a healing place. And I went there and I had to come back. I could find no joy in that beautiful place until I came back to confront my past, to learn something. You see, I had gone through this experience and I want to share it with you a little bit about this other way of thinking. Because when I went through this experience, it took me a long time, came a little late in life, but not too late because I'm still here. Maybe it isn't about destroying or punishing or abusing. Maybe this little secret that's been shared with you that I hope you share with others, it's about some other different kind of approach to power. Maybe it's about Civilizing power. What a thought. <coughs> Civilizing power. Well, well, how do you do that? Where do you start? And with who? I'd like to start with me. I want to start with me where I was in my office. And it happened at that really wonderful time in my life. You see, I was young and I'd been well-educated and well-trained and life was all in front of me. And, uh, well, listen, I had everything. I had uh, the clothes, you know, I had the car, I had the career, I had the colleagues, I had the credit, I had it all. 
You see, and um, well, then I was in my office, and then some mothers from Woburn, a little working class community near here, they came into my office. They told me a story. And the story would change me in ways that I could never have appreciated at the time, but change me, it did. I want to go back to that time. You see, I, I was in my office, and these mothers, they told me this story. You see, it was uh, Ann Anderson's story. Now, maybe some of you know it, but let's, it bears retelling. You see, Ann, she moved into the little town of Woburn, a little working class community with tree-lined streets, beautiful little community, and it, well, it had just opened two new wells to welcome, you know, new friends and new industry, and life was really good. But then there came that time in the early 1970s, 1972 in February, where Jimmy, the youngest, had just, uh, there'd been a round of flu in the family, but he wasn't getting better and Ann became concerned and so she took Jimmy to the doctor and he became concerned and uh, the doctor sent them to the Mass General Hospital where Ann and Jimmy learned to her horror that he had a disease she'd never heard of before, leukemia. And the horror of this diagnosis, it, it led to the roller coaster ride where they'd go into the Mass General for chemotherapy treatments and then it seemed to get better and then it got worse and on and on, terrible. Now something interesting happened. You see, it was in that waiting room where Anne was waiting while her son was getting treated for this disease that she noticed that there was another mother in the waiting room whose child was being treated. And this was a mother she recognized from down the street. And another mother in the waiting room with a child being treated, and this was a mother who was a member of the church. A and another mother whose child was being treated, and that was someone she'd seen in the local supermarket, and this just didn't seem right to her, so she got up, she took courage, it took courage, she walked across the waiting room floor to talk and share with her what she knew, and they shared with each other their common tragedy. Now, Anne was filled with questions, you see, and so she'd ask the doctor, well, what causes this disease? And the doctor says, oh, well, scientists don't know, but, you know, some think a virus causes this disease. Excuse me. Well, she had this thought. The water. It, it smells bad. It tastes bad. People have been complaining about it for years. She had this thought, maybe there's a virus in the water making the kids sick. Why, she talked to her husband about it. Oh, no, 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 why? If there was something wrong with the water, why the authorities would have told us. Oh, yeah, no. So she made those calls to the authorities. Oh, no, the water is safe, passes all the tests. And it was like that for a very long time until Ann woke up to read in the paper, along with her neighbors, that the water that she had been told was safe was not safe but contaminated with chemicals she never heard of before. Tetrachloroethylene, trichloroethylene. And these were chemicals that the, that the newspaper said when fed to mice involuntarily in very large quantities, makes them get cancer. And for Ann, this was like a light bulb going off. It had to be the chemicals in the water making the kids sick. So she went to the doctors. Well, we wouldn't be able to tell. You know, nobody's ever done this before. So she went to the Center for Disease Control. And she went down there to ask them if they couldn't help answer this question. And to their credit, they worked with the State Department of Health, and they came up to the city of Woburn to help them answer a question, whether there were too many children in the community with this disease and whether the water was responsible. She went to the Environmental Protection Agency, a young agency, and she asked them a simple question, who contaminated the wells and when? And to their credit, this young agency went up to the city of Woburn and did their work. Now, after these agencies did all their work, they gathered all the community together at a place like this, and at a place like this, they told them the truth. The EPA said, hey, the wells are contaminated, but we don't know who did it, we don't know when. And the Center for Disease Control and the State Department of Health said, yeah, we've counted, counted the numbers of children with this disease, there are too many, there are too many, but we don't know if the water is responsible. Now for Anne and the others, after the meeting ended, they sat around a little table. It's always just a few. And at that table, they made a decision to get a lawyer to get me. Thinking that getting a lawyer, getting me, would help them get answers to their questions. Now I remember that moment in my conference room. You see, they told me the story, and it was a story, and of course it affected me. You know, I was a lawyer, but I was also a human being. And I was affected by the story, but I had to explain I'm also a lawyer. Says that my job is not to get answers to your questions. That's not my job. You see, my job is to 
well, look at someone's problem. If I can make a case out of it, well, then I can help. But if I can't, I can't. Now, for me to make a case, you see, I got to have a, a wrongdoer, bad guy. Well, who did this? Oh, uh, authorities don't know. Authorities don't know. And I'm thinking to myself, gee, how much time and money am I going to have to spend to find out who did it? And after I find out who, are they going to have the what that make it all worthwhile? And I said, look, there's something else that the law requires. You know, between a wrongdoer and wrong and this terrible injury, there has to be this connection, a thing called causation. Did, did uh, any of your doctors tell you that this contaminated water was responsible for the, the children's disease? No, the authorities don't know, no, doctors don't know. And I'm thinking, gee, is there a scientist or a doctor in this world I could, I could get to testify? And after I sobered them up, what kind of witness would they make? No, 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 no. I knew this was not a case, never been done before, not something I could do. But they wouldn't take no for an answer. And so you know what? I, I knocked on the doors of those who had more experience and more wisdom and more resources. And I asked them if they would help. And I found out why they had more wisdom and more experience and more resources. They were busy. But thank you very much. So I went back to the families. I told them the truth. I can't help you. Do you know what the mothers did? Do you know what they did? They held their children up to me. And they said, don't you get it? Our children are ch choking to death on the lies. We need the truth. The truth. I'm a lawyer. The truth. I was trained about this thing, the truth. You see, the truth, why, why that's something you got to go take. The truth, that's something you have to go and invade somebody's other property to get. You know, and when you do that, there's, you know, they don't like that. And, oh, there's, you know, and I thought about it. It was just... Uh, well, I, you know, I had to, I tell you, I, I thought about it like a lawyer thinks about it. You see, I, I thought about the children, I thought about the challenge, and I thought about the treasure. And I said, this is what I want to do. So I went and I talked to my partners, and they said, hey, all for one and one for all, we decided, hey, this is what we will do. And we joined the journey of these families. Now, this was a journey. You see, we had to go and talk to all these people with different experiences that had never been asked to to look at this problem before. And it all became very confusing, all these different experts talking all these different languages, and we decided to bring them together at a place like this. And we did. We brought them all together. You see, there was a hydrogeologist, and a geologist, and an immunologist, and a cardiologist, and a psychiatrist, mostly for me and my two partners. So we brought all these ologists together in one room at one time to think about something that no one had ever asked those folks to do before, not a corporation, you know, not a university, no government had ever asked all those folks at one time to come and talk to each other about what? Whether these chemicals in water can get children, make children sick, can give them cancer. Now I have to tell you, it was really interesting because we learned a lot. We learned about, you know, the making of things. You know, when you make things, you make waste. We learned about the chemical constituents of that waste. We learned about what they did with that waste at the end of the day and, and where it went and what happened to folks when it got there. Something else we learned. We learned about the truth about these chemicals and the conduct that can kill. You know, I remember thinking about all of this, and I have to tell you, all this knowledge and wisdom and insight was, uh, it was intoxicating. You see, because I realized as a lawyer, I could bring the case that nobody had ever brought before. And we brought the case that had never been brought before. You see, we sued these two companies, two of the largest corporations in the world at that time, W.R. Grace and Beatrice Foods. One was eight billion, the other one was six billion. Shows you how far we've come. The scale has gotten bigger. But they were really big then. They made lots of things, almost everything, between the two of them. And uh, we did sue them. And we accused them of engaging in conduct that made the children sick, that gave them cancer. You see, we, we had done the test that showed that, yeah, these chemicals in small quantities, yes, they were, but they're not so small in the water that the body doesn't see them and wants to get rid of them. And in the act of trying to get rid of these chemicals, it breaks that little strand of life, and in that broken strand, a cancer can take root. So we did bring that case, and it allowed us, you see, the law gives you a lot of power, and we got to go on their property. And I went on their property, you know, looking for things, like lawyers look for things. And I came across something I'd never really experienced before, a pit. You know, pits, they're, well, pits are dug by people to bury things. 
And uh, I learned about pits, that they're dir dirty and they're dark and they're dangerous. And, you know, as a lawyer, you know, you go in, you, you start digging a pit, you realize you end up digging your own, digging your own pit. And something else about going on somebody else's property and digging a pit and discovering things, usually they return the favor, invade your property, and start digging in your pits where you bury things. Now, with all that invasion, there's conflict. And with all that conflict, there was war. And war is the only way to describe it. Now, this war, this legal war, was just like every other war. You know, it, it, it took much more than it gave back. It took everything, in fact, and it ended the only way a war can end, in exhaustion. Now, it made for a really great book and a pretty good movie. And I urge you, if you ever had the chance, Jonathan Hart did a great job in the book, really got into the belly of the beast. But I have to tell you, at the end of that experience, we had our victories and our defeats, but at the end, you see, there came that moment where I had to survey the wreckage of all that had gone on. And when I surveyed that wreckage, when the case was over, and we had victories and we had defeats, but you know, at the end, I couldn't see anything. You see, I went to get the car, it was gone. Yeah, they, they took it. And my credit, uh, they took that too. And the clothes, yeah, and the career, uh, it was all gone. All of it. You know, and, and I had to do, like I say, what any self-respecting human being would do in such a circumstance. I got out of town, I went to Hawaii, but I did have to come back. And when I came back, something interesting happened. You see, we had shared all this information with the environmental agencies. And the environmental agencies had looked at all that information that we had shared and had said, hey, the families are right. And they did something interesting. They called the companies together in a room like this. After our case was over and the war was over, they called them together at a place like this and they shared with them what we had shared with them. And at the end of all that sharing, something interesting happened. The companies, well, they wrote a check for $70 million for a cleanup. It'll take 50 years. Yeah, they, you know, that happened. And something else really interesting happened. You see, um, uh, well, I had to come home. And I had to confront my past. Now, where I live, it's a beautiful little place, overlooks that harbor that unites all of us. And I'm on this little granite headland cliff, you know, overlooking the ocean, that troubled spot that changes every day. And, and I had to come back. And when I came back, I, was a, I had to confront the past. And when I confronted the past, all I had was pain and failure. And I couldn't see what I had gained, only what I had lost, you see. And when I was so uh, in turmoil, I stumbled, I tumbled, I nearly tumbled all the way over the edge, I have to tell you. And I, and I managed to grab hold of the outstretched fingers of a branch, you know, and I held on for dear life. But I have to tell you, you know, I, in my exhausted state, I couldn't see a way up and I couldn't see a way out. And all I could think about was failure and what I'd lost. And well, I, I closed my eyes to accept my fate. And I have to tell you, it was in that long, endless moment, swinging between life and death, that I realized that I had something in my hand, something important. A and this thought, it made me want to live, you see? And I saw that one branch leads to another, and from the branch to a limb, and from the limb to the trunk, and from the trunk to solid ground, and I was so overwhelmed by my accomplishment, I decided to stay right here, this place we call home, and I decided to make this place my home. I decided to get married, and then three reasons came forth for me to want to stay firmly rooted right here in this place. Something else interesting happened. You see, the book came out by Jonathan Haar, and, and then the movie, and then the move, the, the uh, phone calls all started to come, especially on a Sunday from these people who said, hey, uh, I read about how you're this lawyer and, and how you gave up everything for your clients, including your sanity. You sound like just a lawyer for me. Ah! No, 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 no. But there was a phone call. It was a mother, it's always a mother, from Toms River, New Jersey. And she said, you know, we've been reading this book about this contaminated water and these two companies. Well, we've got contaminated water and we've got two companies. It's always two. Two big companies. It's always two big companies. And we got a lot of children sick with cancer, and we got a lot of questions and few answers, and we're wondering if you wouldn't come down and share with us what you know. How could I say no to her? So we did. Came into her living room and we shared, and we decided to do something interesting. We decided to form a partnership. Yeah, between lawyer and client, kind of a novel approach. You know, partners, they, um, they look at each other as equals. They look at problems solving as something that you do together and that all of us have limited resources and we all have to use those limited resources to solve the problem. 
Now, we were so intoxicated by that idea, we decided to knock on the doors of the local government and the state government and the federal government to form a partnership. And that worked so well, we decided to do something else, never been done before, I decided to knock on the doors of the lawyers for the companies responsible and um, who should uh, come to the door but the lawyer who used to represent Beatrice Foods. Ah! Oh my goodness! Well, it's not like we didn't have something to talk about. So we went to a place like this. And at a place like this, we kind of shared with each other, like lawyers can do, you know. And at the end of all that sharing, we decided to announce a formation of a limited partnership. We decided to meet at a place like this, share with us what we knew over time. And I have to tell you, it wasn't a month, it wasn't several months, it wasn't a year, but a couple of years of all that sharing, something interesting happened. We made an announcement, a public announcement, that we had come to a resolution that we had actually signed an agreement, an agreement to give the families the economic tools to, to dig out of the rubble of their experience. Now something else interesting happened. You see there came that summer's night when uh, there's new agency, uh, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, that's an agency uh, formed by Congress in the wake of Woburn to help communities determine if toxic chemicals in water can make people sick. And this agency looked at all the data that we had shared with them and they brought the families together and the community together on that summer's night and they made an announcement. The families were right. The water was responsible. The children who were exposed in utero to these, this chemical contaminated water had a 13 times greater risk of contracting the disease than those who were not exposed. And the connection was so powerful that these agencies who had never seen such a connection before, announced it that night. It became the first study of its kind to say we've got to care about what's in the water because if we don't, it can make us sick, become a shroud over our future. Now I remember that night, I remember going home in the company of the families that night, not so many as when we first started, and it was an interesting night, you see, because um, when I thought back about you know, it had been uh, 17 years since the wells closed and 15 years since Jimmy Anderson died, but I didn't feel pain and it wasn't too late for the truth. I had a thought. The truth. I think I was taught wrong. The truth, uh, it's not something you have to go and take. The truth, it's, it's not something you have to go and get. The truth, it's all around us. And we don't have to go and get it. It actually comes to us when we share experience. And when we share experience, soil is created in which life takes root. You know, and, and from that night and to the present, I've had a chance to kind of think about things and I, I, had, I had this thought. I want to share it with you, sort of like the branch that was shared with me that saved my life. Let me offer it to you. Maybe as we sit here, you know, as citizens, with you, with your whole life in front of you and choices to make and hopefully ways to help people about how to make those choices, the good ones and the bad ones to identify them. Maybe we should think about this. Maybe we should think about all the life around us and the lesson that life is trying to teach us if we are willing to accept it. It's a simple and a basic one. When life is shared, life is given so life can go on. It really is that simple. And maybe if we accept that lesson and we apply that lesson with each other and with our planetary home, we'll learn to live on and with this earth together. Thank you very much. Thank you. Time for questions? So here's your opportunity to cross-examine a lawyer. Take advantage of it. Doesn't often come. Usually it's the other way around. <laughs> Here's where you can really mete out justice. It's always the hardest for the first one. Yes, there was. With one of the companies, there was a settlement. And uh, the settlement came in actually mid-1980s uh, with one of the companies and did provide an a, uh, economic resource to cushion uh, the challenges that they had. And each family had a tremendous challenge, you can imagine. So we did have that, absolutely. So there was a, that was one of the victories of which we are very proud that they had some measure of justice and some, some economic means there to cushion the shock. And they've had, you know, a lot of challenges. The, the legacy of that contaminated water uh, affected the Woburn community and these families were, uh, you know, 
symbols of that. How are the children doing? That's a great question. Two of the children, excuse, uh, five of the children actually had died. and uh, It was a very high mortality for this disease, which was always a big puzzle. Now, since then, uh, the mortality rate for children with leukemia has gone dramatically down, thank goodness. Much better ways to treat the disease, but we also feel that the, that the con constant exposure to the contaminated water was not helping them, you know, get over their disease. We feel that the studies show, you know, that it played a causative role. Uh, the two children who survived have gone on to, you know, do really great things. One became a lawyer in the environment. Can you imagine? Wow. <laughs> I don't know about the first choice, I like the second one, but, uh, but anyway, they're very committed uh, folks and really good people and we get together every so often and it's a really, it's a joy, you know, to see that. So uh, they've had a lot of health challenges in their families, but uh, they have lots of great spirit. Well, that's a really great question because we looked at all of the health histories of all the families together and we found in each of the families from the adults, you know, they were young folks when they came into town and we actually watched the progress of their health over time as they had their families and uh, we felt that uh, one of the things is that it was profoundly affecting health, all sorts of different kinds of health problems. But no study has ever been done about adult disease and the relationship to contaminated water. It's just never been done. The children are the most uh, sensitive indicators, and the first studies that have ever been done have, have been done with children. Now, there was the uh, Woburn study, and then the Toms River also did a study um, based on the Woburn model, and in fact, the Toms River study also concluded, like the Woburn one did, that uh, there was a profound impact on the children's health, and that the incidence of leukemia in that community uh, had a greater risk for children who were exposed, especially in utero. So it was confirmatory of that. But nobody's ever really done uh, the adult uh, studies, or even really a, a, a gross populations of people, you know, all together. This is a developing area of environmental science, and it's one in an area that I hope, urge perhaps there are some scientists or those uh, who have some desires to get into that field, but environmental science is a very young field and needs lots of folks to help us answer these questions. So it's a great question. We don't have a really good answer yet. No, no, there's not a community in our country, of course there's not one in the world. You know, when people come together and they stay any kind of length of time, uh, you know, they make things and they uh, uh, use things and um, they test things on occasion, unfortunately, and the making and the using and the testing of things leaves a residue. And, you know, uh, Rachel Carson talked about this, actually her book came out the same year that the Wells G&H opened up in 1960s, uh, 64, and in her book, Rachel Carson did something really interesting. What she did is that she went and looked for all the places that life takes root, you know, the air, the earth, and the water, and she found stuff there that didn't belong there, and these were from the making and the using and the testing of things, chemicals and radiation, in all these places where life takes root. And she wrote her book, and she said that, uh, gave us a warning that we have to be mindful that we are placing things you know, chemicals and radiation in the places where life needs to take root. And chemical, and if we don't take heed that these chemicals and radiation, you know, could form a sinister partnership, begin to eat away at the fabric of our life. And if we didn't take heed, this, this tattered fabric could be like a, like a shroud. So she gave us this warning, we have to be mindful of it. And we're really good at making things now, you know, and we're really good at, uh, you know, there are all these things that we like and rely on, of course, but they come at, uh, there's, a, there's a waste to them. And the question we have to ask is, is it a necessary waste? And what do we do with this waste? You know, is this a sustainable waste? Do we, what do we do? How do we have to begin to think in terms of the whole life cycle of a product? Because very much that's going to determine the life cycle of us. You know, the life cycle of how we make things and use things, get rid of things, uh, is going to determine our own little life cycle. And we need to be very mindful of these things. We have to begin to think about because the earth is getting a lot smaller because there's a lot more of us and we're getting really good at doing things. You know, it's not just, uh, well, knocking down one forest to build things. It's talking about now, you know, uh, not about maybe fishing out one fishery, but now we get, uh, or, you know, turning one river aflame, we now got to think about a burning planet. You know, the scale of it is just so big. So we have to begin to think and use our talents to think about our impact on the earth, our impact with each other uh, and the earth. And this is something that we need all of your brains to think about and this kind of different way of thinking about how do we solve these problems of living together? How do we solve these problems of uh, how we treat each other and how we treat each other and how we treat our earthly home very much connected? 
And the, if we allow for abuse of power between each other, it's very much like the abuse of power between us and the earth. When we abuse that power, uh, it's not sustainable. People get hurt, communities get destroyed, physically, emotionally, uh, environmentally. And at the end of the day, we need a place to take root. You know, like every other living thing, we have to root ourselves in our communities. And so we've got to care about the air and the earth and the water, which is our home. And we've got to fight this, um, this kind of one-sided thinking or one-dimensional thinking that just says, well, I've got to get rid of the air and the earth and the water to extract this thing I think I need that has value. And this kind of extractive metaphor and this kind of extractive imperative that we have that just sees about the clearing away of things in order to get something of value, I think we've got to change. We've got to begin to think in terms of an energy source, not as something we extract and therefore have to clear away air, earth and water and communities attached to them. We've got to think about something, an energy that is sustaining to us, not something we have to extract. Like, like you know, in the old days, uh, not too far from here, they thought that the best way to get the truth was to extract it from people, literally, you know, by pouring stones on their chest and dunking them in the water long enough. You know, it's kind of extraction uh, metaphor for the truth. Well, we have the same one with energy, and I think we've got to change both. And both of us will evolve us from a kind of a 16th century thinking, I think more to a 21st century thinking, which what? At the end of that, this century, hopefully we're going to look, you know, we're going to be healthier, and healthier and safer and better at the end of the century than we are now, as opposed to the other way around. But the choices that you make and the thinking that you apply uh, to living is very much going to determine how we get there and in what shape we get there. Well, that's really interesting. It's really easy to destroy something of value like an aquifer. And there has never been an aquifer that we have actually uh, totally cleaned up. Now, uh, once we get these chemical uh, chemicals into a uh, water supply, an aquifer, and I, I urge all of you to think about this. It's very easy to get them in there. Once they're in there, very hard to get them out. And there's all sorts of different uh, ways to try and do that. Now, let me offer you the, the um, important story of Tom's River. You see, they learned from Woburn. In Woburn, um, their wells were contaminated. They discovered it too late, closed down the wells. Damage had been done. But in, in Tom's River, you see, because of Woburn, they discovered the contamination. They said, oh, no, we can't drink this water. We've got to go fix it. So what they do, they, they used the best technology at the time to get rid of the chemicals they thought were there, which were solvents. And the solvents were volatile, so they stripped them. So they had the water supply and this very sophisticated equipment that stripped the solvents out of the water and let the children drink the water. Well, 10 years later, all that, they found out something, that there were other chemicals in there, semi-volatile, that you couldn't strip out. And they stayed in there. And they also uh, wreaked havoc with the health of that community. So again, a, a cautionary tale about, you know, we think we know what's in the water we put there, but uh, we don't often. So it, we don't often get it right. So we have to think in terms of keeping water the way nature intended it, kind of work with nature. You know, it's developed over a few billion years this beautiful machinery to create clean drinking water. And when we mimic that technology, nature's technology, we get clean water. I think it's, that's a wonderful question. I think two parts. Number one, we should be very mindful of, the, of our supplies that have not been contaminated and protect them. And those supplies that are, we need to fully test and develop technologies that will assure us that it actually is water the way nature intended us to drink it. And we have these technologies. We have to apply them. But we can't, well, when we do, when we apply them, we have to be honest with ourselves about what we're finding and uh, look for all the things that we know could be there, as opposed to just looking for some things and hoping that the others are not there. So the answer is, uh, it's got, we got to deal with, we got to recycle that water we've contaminated. We've got to figure out the right technologies to do it to protect ourselves and protect the supplies we have. Now we have huge, we're blessed with rich aquifers right now. You, we are part of a world that has rich underwater uh, water supplies. And we get lots and lots of rain, you know, comes our way every year. That's all great here and in the Midwest. And, and there are some great aquifers out in the far west. But we're now having this uh, struggle as a society about energy. You know, you see these advertisements on television, you know, about natural gas, the clean energy alternative. Well, we have to ask ourselves, how are we extracting that gas? Well, one way of extracting the gas is to engage in this process of what we call fracking, in which they drill holes deep into the earth to uh, 
to uh, fracture the earth and get gas out. Well, the one little problem with that is it has to pass through too many of our aquifers. And so we have these little uh, pipes going down, you know, pass through the aquifers to get at this gas we want, but we've got to think about these little tubes in the aquifer because the, the noxious chemicals that go back down, they also come back up and they can leak out of these tubes, they get into the aquifer. These are things we have to be thinking about. Yes, we want the gas, we want the energy, right? But we've got to think about the, what we have to do to make sure that what we're getting, we're not the poorer for it. We think it's going to enrich us, but in fact it may impoverish us. These are the things that we need to think, a, a way of thinking about our needs and how we can treat each other in the earth in a way in which we're at the better for it, not the worse for it. So a great question, and we're all going to have to work on that answer together. But what do we do about the supplies that we have already contaminated? This is, this is, that's the question. That is the question. And every day I get up and I get faced with that question, and, uh, yeah, and there's not a simple answer to it. But I start with this premise, because I think that not starting with this premise, uh, gets in the way of our thinking. There's no alternative. You know, they talk about this kind of, this wonderful thought you've, that's been shared with you, sometimes we refer to it, and I don't think so complimentary, as alternative dispute resolution. Well, I suggest to you that there is no alternative to a dispute except resolving it. How do you resolve a dispute? And the problem we have, the problem of our thinking, the one that I grew up with, you know, that I got trained with was that, well, if you have a problem, no problem. I, as a lawyer, will make sure that there are more problems. So that the person with more problems will have an incentive to get, solve your problem. See, problem plus problem equals more problems. That's simple arithmetic. It took me a couple of decades of experience to figure out that simple arithmetic. Problem plus problem means more problem. If you have a problem and you minus the problem, you then have less of a problem. You have a resolution. That simple arithmetic we cannot lose sight of. How do you get there? How do we resolve a dispute? There's only one method. It was developed, you know, around the same time that one of us decided that picking up a rock was a good idea, and someone else decided that using this thing here, this voice box and talking, and maybe sitting on a rock as opposed to holding one, that these two little competing forces you know, they, 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 they started to compete with which one was a better thing to deal with this dispute that we're having. And unfortunately, we have defaulted more to the picking up the rock or the stick than we have about sitting on the rock and talking about it. There is no substitute for it. It is that, it is that part of our evolution in which we use this and we use this and we use this to make, you know, pictures with our hands, not to throw and, you know, apply force to each other, but to actually convey information and thinking. That's the civilizing thing. That's what, that is the definition of civilization, is using this and not the rock and the stick. So I think that the, we have to think in terms of how do we apply that? Because at the end of the day, when people sit around a table, the f first thing that happens Forget the dispute. The first thing that happens when they enter the room and they sit at a table is what? Respect. As soon as they come into a room and they sit at a table, they are making a statement without anybody opening their mouth, I respect you and you respect me enough to sit here at this table without trying to hurt each other. And at that table, they can then have a chance of doing what? To talk to each other. And what's it talking about? It's the therapy that does what? That talks about the past, and what happened, and trying to get a consensus about that, make some sense out of that, and in making some sense out of that past, try and figure out about the present that can make the future be better than the past. That is the secret that you all have learned, are learning, are studying, and hopefully will be sharing with many others. It's a wonderful way of resolving disputes because it's the only way of resolving disputes. Every other way is terminating disputes. The problem with termination of disputes is often people, communities, and the earth, parts of the earth, get terminated in the process. So we want something more sustaining. So how do we get them to go to a room? And I, when I come to a group, you know, a community that's having a problem, I say, look, didn't say it was easy. But at the end of the day, it's the problem that needs a solution. 
And it's the problem that's the driver. Now, the more honest we can be about the problem, and the more we can bring that problem to our consciousness, and the consciousness of those who are all involved in the problem, the more we can do that, the more we can make people aware of the problem and the need for a solution, the greater the incentive and the driver to sit at a table and resolve it. Because most of the time, when people are in dispute, the reaction is, with the person, especially one who has more power, they tend to say, there's no problem. The one who has the power usually says, tends to say, there's no problem. Because everything's fine for them. But those who have less power and are feeling it, well, they do feel the problem and it's not fine for them. So we have to begin to get people to see, be honest about the problem. You know, and the first thing about, you know, what they say is when someone is, um, got some major problem, you know, in family situation or whatever, is making them acknowledge it. And unless there is that acknowledgement, there's no real hope. And that's what it's all about. Acknowledging our problems, and we all have them, and working them on it together, because we're social creatures. How we get people to see that, that, the, that it's in their common self-interest to sit at that table is everything. So long as we have this alternative system out there that promises power is yours, if you inveigle, you know, if you curry favor, if you have connections, if, you, you know, got, if you've got a really great lawyer, you'll get that power and you can impose your solution. And power that abuses likes that and power that is, a, that is abused also likes it because they hope that maybe they'll be able to do to the other what the other did to them. And this kind of mindset fuels our legal system right now. That is a basic problem with our legal system. This is a part of the tape that should stop so that it will not, uh, when I go into court, you know, tomorrow, they won't be, hey, were you the guy who said this process is a disease process? Yeah, that was me, it's on tape. <laughs> it's a disease process because it's a diseased way of thinking. This is Chancery Court, with its decaying houses and blighted lands in every shire, with its worn out lunatic in every madhouse, and its dead in every churchyard. This uh, is the Chancery Court with its, with its uh, uh, unfortunate suitor who goes in uh, slipshod heels and threadbare dress, begging and borrowing among every man's acquaintance. This is the Chancery Court that gives to moneyed might the means abundantly of wearying out the right. This is the chancery court that uh, so exhausts finances, patience, courage, hope, so overtakes the brain and breaks the heart that there is not an honorable man among its practitioners who would not give, who often does not give the warning, suffer all the wrongs that can be done you rather than go there. Now that was said by Charles Dickens, you know, about 150 years ago, and those words are as true then as they are now. It is time for us to recognize that this place that we say we go to help us resolve these disputes has got it wrong. There's something fundamentally wrong. That's what I learned in, in, my, th in my little journey. And I'm very thankful that it's something that you have learned earlier in your journey. And I hope that uh, with me at my little stage and you at your little stage, maybe we can help others get to see that there's another way of dealing with this. How, what do I, what I'd like to see? Well, let me tell you this. Here's what I see. Here's what I fear, okay? We're really good at things. And our dominion over the earth is, you know, we're really strong, got a lot of this power. We're running out of time because we're so good at things. So I, we need to have to do something that allows us to what? The, 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 the um, most efficient transfer of information occurs at a table, like you're sitting at, where people talk to each other. That's the most efficient transfer of information. We need that very efficient transfer of information to what? To understand what we are doing to each other and the earth right now, not 10 years from now or 50 years from now, or after you know, a well has, has you know, one of 2,500 wells, our technology has failed us, and what now? The whole Gulf of Mexico, the most important ecosystem to our country's economy, is now you know, uh, suffering and, and could be permanently damaged. That's a little late. We need to get it right now. So we need to, on these disputes that we have with each other and about the Earth, we've got to do it now and talk honestly now. So what I'm hoping is, if we start giving people new metaphors, if you, in doing your work, help you know, another person to see that sitting here and talking about it is better than you know, trying to hurt somebody some different way, you know, whether it's on the internet or you know, with a click or whatever it happens to be that human beings devise all these 
ways that you know to want to hurt someone else for some reason because they want to get something or because they think something happened or whatever it is, but that this is a much better way of understanding what's happening and solving it. And if they get that idea and someone else gets that idea, maybe it'll affect our politics. And maybe we won't see it as a win or lose over power, but how we'll maybe mutually enlighten ourselves about what is the right policy decision because in the end of the day we all got to live with that policy decision and maybe we shouldn't make it a titanic struggle between, you know, Democrat or Republican, this way, you know, my way or the highway, all that kind of, that affects our politics and also our law. So all these branches hopefully could get transformed with this kind of thinking about how if we're honest with each other and resolve disputes with each other by learning from the past, then the next day we'll be smarter and better and we'll not have wasted our time. We'll have more valuable time to use on other things. So that's what I'm hoping will happen. I know it doesn't work because you, all of us have decided it doesn't work on September 11th when the terrible thing happened to us and shook us to our core, what was the first thing we did in 72 hours? We got rid of the legal system and said, hey, listen, uh, any disputes about this, about money? Uh, we're going to go over here, we have a czar, he's going to decide it. And oh, by the way, uh, in order to get the truth out of all these folks and how it happened, well, we're going to send them down to this other place. Uh, it doesn't do with the criminal justice system because we don't trust that system. We're going to do it the old-fashioned way. You know? So we, I know that we, as a, as a group, don't believe in our system because when we really need it, it's the first thing we get rid of. So if we're getting rid of it when we really need it, then what are we doing with it when, you know, every day? And every day we are mangling lives and wasting time and resources. So I think we have to come to that ugly fact. It ain't working. Yeah. And here's the problem. Yes, the problem is this, is that power that is abusing is going to tend to want to go where? Do you think they want to go here or they want to go over here? If, if what I just said is true, that power likes power, then if I'm power and I'm abusing someone, I'm going to probably want to go over here. That's the problem. We have at the center of our dispute system a system that pulses out this toxic notion, come here and I will give you the power and you will get what you want and you will impose your views and what you want on the other. And to power's ears, that sounds pretty enchanting. And to those who are abused, unfortunately, it's also enchanting because, oh, wait a minute, now I can do to them what they have done to me. And so we go to this place and that pulses out this toxic notion. So what? So you are invited to do what? To uh, go in the attic or down in the basement and do that little thing you're talking about, that uh, mediation thing, that talking about thing. Hey, we got a room over here, you know, uh, well, you know, it's, uh, well, we ran out of money this year, you don't know, got chairs or tables and not even a room, but, you know, we'll see what you can do. We had to stop that thinking. We got to start thinking about the fact that a table and chairs and a room is about the cheapest thing we can afford as a society. It's like really inexpensive compared to a court system, a prison system, a probation system, and all of the, the detritus of, of terminated disputes in which people are the worse for the wear, not the better. That's expensive. We begin to see that doing it this way is actually cheap. It saves time, it saves money, and you know what? It makes people who really don't like each other sometimes actually find out that hey, you know what, you, you can help me here, and we can actually repair relationships. You know well, what Berger said? was to become healers of the law. He surprised all of his brethren when he said it. He, he became the father, they say, of the Alternative Dispute Resolution Revolution in 1982 when he said, hey folks, I've come to this realization, the Chief Justice now, the Supreme Court, litigation, it's for crazy people. You gotta sit down and talk about it. And you have to all become healers of the law. Well, you are healers of the rift. Help us heal, we gotta have the healing metaphor, not this contest deciding metaphor. But until and unless we have at the core of it, okay, the social value, the political value, and the reality that the table and the chairs is the place we go, and we relegate, you know, that other thing, that contest deciding thing, for those who, who we make it socially unacceptable not to go here, and then what we do is that those who, who don't want this, we allow them, they can select themselves to this other thing, but it's not there to favor power. So there's no siren song. This is where the action is. Here's where we invest all of our, and make it socially unacceptable but otherwise. As soon as that happens, as soon as that happens, power comes into the room, the one with more power, and the one with a little less power, they all come into the room and they say we respect each other. 
And then what happens? Power becomes civilized. It's that simple, it's that magic that occurs in a dispute. Every lawyer, they can spend years in a system in which they're told not to talk to each other. And then there'll come a moment where they talk to each other, and in an instant they find out, oh, that wasn't true. You didn't do that. And then all of a sudden, the problem gets solved. That's the magic we need to inject at the front end and make that the center of our attention, focus. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to be here. It's been so cool seeing what, what you guys do. I'm Healy, and I'm from Marblehead, Massachusetts, and I'm a freshman at Marblehead High, so we have my, my school has a mediation group here today. And um, basically, growing up, I was always one of those kids that was super shy and didn't talk much and barely had any self-confidence and just really felt like there was nothing special about me. And in the summer, coming out of fifth grade and going into sixth, I came home and decided that I was going to learn to play guitar and write songs and spent however long after that writing as many songs as I possibly could and kind of making up for all the things I was always too scared to say. Since then, I've had the chance to play all over the place and play in schools all over the place and talk to kids and teens about self-expression and finding their voice and using it to do good and create change. And that's exactly what, what you guys do in your schools every day and, and use your voices and help other kids to find their voices. And so I'm going to do one that I wrote when I first started doing this whole music thing. And um, this is called Dreaming for a While.
going to do with a song that I wrote when I was in seventh grade. And um, I read about a friend of mine that went through a really hard time with bullying and kind of gossip and rumors and things spiraling downward in that sense. And um, a lot of times I'll write a song that's like, this is going to go on my CDs or I'm going to play this at my gigs or I'm going to go show this to the world or whatever. But a lot of times, or not a lot, but sometimes I'll write one that's the total opposite and it's sort of just for me and my own way of dealing with something and I never really intend on showing it to anyone. And that was the case with this song. And um, as much as it was about my friend and everything she was going through, it was more me and my own struggle and not knowing how to help her and just kind of having to watch her go through this thing that I didn't even understand. And um, so in the midst of all that, I stumbled across an organization called the Pacer Center. And they're based out of Minneapolis. And Minneapolis, I can't say the word, but Minneapolis, Minnesota. And, um, they originally got started to work with kids with disabilities and their families and all of the struggles that come with that. But since then, they branched out into Kids Against Bullying and Teens Against Bullying. And um, I stumbled across Teens Against Bullying and was so impressed with the, what they were doing. And they created this whole movement of teens coming together, trying to bring an end to bullying, but with no, with no like, no fake stuff to please adults. It was so real and it was so for teens and it was, they just really had. They really had their stuff together and I loved what they were doing. And um, So I found a lot of comfort and a lot of information that I needed on their website and I emailed the woman and sent her my song and told her my story and just thanked her for, for all the ways that she'd helped me without, without even knowing. And um, she came back and was like, we love this song and we'd love to send it out to schools across the country as a part of our National Bullying Prevention Month, which is every October. And um, so I got to work with her and other people at the Pacer Center and come up with classroom discussion questions and a whole kind of classroom toolkit um, to go along with the song and to go out to schools all over the place. And so I spent most of seventh grade coming home from school, my own school, and getting emails from kids all over the country telling me about how they related to the song and about their friends that have been through bullying and about themselves and how they've been through bullying and how they've bullied other kids themselves. And um, and it just became so much more real to me that it's not just something that, that we see on the news and that people talk about, adults talk about, that legislate, legislative people talk about, but it's a, real, it's a real thing for us teens and it's kind of our issue to deal with. Um, and so I'm really proud of this song and I'm really proud of the Pacer Center. And this one's for my friend. It's called She's Fun.
to the sea.